Pope's departure. Francis leaves for Sri Lanka today. Our Alan Holdren is traveling with him. He checks in tonight. Conspicuously absent, the Obama administration not represented in a show of world solidarity against terrorism in Paris. An Arizona Christian church is taking their case to the Supreme Court today, saying a town is violating their free speech. I'm Jason Calvi. I'll have that story coming up next. And Scottish Archbishop, a church leader close to Francis, offers insight on the Pope's trip and its impact on the Universal Church. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Monday, January 12th, 2015. Good evening from Washington. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. Security is tight in Paris as France continues to come to grips with last week's unprecedented terror attacks. There is great apprehension about what may lie ahead. Chief White House correspondent Suzanne LaFranchi has more. Suzanne? Brian, this weekend proved to be a moment of solidarity as the world showed support for France. More than 40 heads of state came together to denounce the brutal attacks. However, the U.S. proved to be a no-show, a time when France could use some high-profile support. Paris appearing more like a military zone than a world-class European city, as 10,000 troops were ordered to protect sensitive sites, half Jewish schools, as the hunt continues for the accomplices to the Islamic terrorists. The EU parliament paused for a moment of silence during Monday's session. Many members holding signs with the symbolic refrain, I am Charlie. Hundreds of thousands of citizens filled the streets of Paris Sunday to take part in the unity rally. The city and nation are trying to heal after a series of terrorist attacks that claimed the lives of 17 victims. Paris's chief rabbi says the nation will prevail against the terrorists. And to fight against the terrorists is very easy. We have just to be together. Islam is peace, Islam is fraternity, but not terrorism and war. In a sign of solidarity, some 40 world leaders locked arms with French President Francois Hollande to remember the dead. Both Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Palestine Authority President Muhammad Abbas attended. Conspicuously absent, a ranking member of the Obama administration. In a rare public admission of error, the White House said to date they made a mistake and should have sent a cabinet-level official to Paris. It's fair to say that we should have sent someone with a higher profile. This enemy is persistent. Holly Stimson, who oversaw Guantanamo in the Bush administration, says he's more concerned with policies than public relations. He's critical of Obama's military budget cuts, setting arbitrary deadlines to end the war, and continuing to release Guantanamo prisoners. The enemy is emboldened. Our allies are questioning our resolve. Uh, and the American people are getting frustrated and feeling vulnerable that another attack may come our way. Authorities now say there may be as many as six terrorist cells involved in the Paris attacks, and they may still be at large. Secretary of State John Kerry, who has been in India, promises to go to France as soon as he can as a sign of support. Next month, the White House is holding a summit on terrorism to address problems with this worldwide problem. Brian? All right, Suzanne, thank you. And today, Pope Francis denounced the religious extremism that inspired the Paris attacks. He said the hostage takers were slaves to deviant forms of religion. The Holy Father made the comments during his annual speech to Vatican-based ambassadors. He called for a unanimous response from the international community to end fundamentalist terrorism. Francis also asked Muslim leaders to denounce extremism within their faith groups. Well, it's been 20 years since a pope visited Sri Lanka. This week, as we embrace compassion, our coverage of the trip, the island nation prepares to receive Pope Francis, who is now en route. Pope Francis today boards his plane in Rome, headed to Southeast Asia. Meanwhile, Sri Lanka's capital city is putting the final touches on its welcome for the Holy Father. For a nation torn by civil war and ethnic strife, many hope the Pope's visit will foster unity. Whether you're Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, it doesn't matter. Everybody's going to be lined up at that God face screen to see the Pope. Another sign of unity will be the Pope's canonization of Sri Lanka's first saint, Joseph Vaz, on Wednesday. The 17th century missionary helped revive the Catholic faith in Sri Lanka during a time of persecution. When even odds were against him and uh, the enemies were trying to arrest him, he still uh, trusted in God and went about doing the work of the apostolate 
in face of troubles and dangers. The soon-to-be saint ministered to opposing ethnic groups, something that Francis is also expected to do. In Sri Lanka, there are uh, issues uh, revolving around uh, violence, uh, ethnic violence, um, social uh, unrest in some parts of the country. And I think the Pope, he feels very strongly that Catholics have a part to play in uh, works of solidarity, dialogue, and peacemaking. Our Alan Holdren is traveling on the papal plane to Sri Lanka. Before departure, he gave us a rundown of Pope Francis's schedule during this short trip. Pope Francis will be in Sri Lanka for all of 48 hours. He'll be meeting with state and Catholic church leaders, but also and perhaps most importantly with interreligious leaders, representatives from the majority Buddhist and Hindu populations, but also from the minority Muslim and Christian populations. He's going to be inviting them to lasting peace and reconciliation after the 30-year civil war that divided the population until 2009. He'll also be visiting a Marian site hundreds of miles away from Colombo, the capital, and he'll be celebrating the canonization mass for Joseph Vaz, called the Apostle of Sri Lanka. All right, thanks and safe travels, Alan, to you and Pope Francis. And in just a few minutes, Georgetown University's Tim Shaw will be joining us with more on the Sri Lanka trip, the analysis of the Pope's apostolic visit to Sri Lanka. And now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. The latest attack in Nigeria is the deadliest massacre in the history of Boko Haram. This according to the human rights group Amnesty International. Villagers who fled the violence say the terrorists burned the town of Baga to the ground. They say civilians were slaughtered like insects. The killing unfolded over several days. Local officials report the death toll could reach 2,000. Amnesty International reports Boko Haram remains in control of that town. They told us that Boko Haram first of all attacked the military base just outside of Baga and overwhelmed the soldiers stationed there. They moved inside Baga town and shot civilians in their homes, in the streets, and as they tried to flee into the surrounding bush. More than 10,000 people have died in this past year, the fifth of a five-year insurgency by Boko Haram. The Twitter and YouTube accounts for the U.S. Central Command were suspended today after a cyber attack by Islamic State sympathizers. Just after midday, a series of tweets popped up on the Central Command's page. They appeared to be warnings from the Middle Eastern terrorist group. The tweets also included some military members' personal information. The Central Command's YouTube page also posted what looked like terrorist propaganda. The FBI is helping to investigate that apparent hack of Central Command. Divers find one black box from the AirAsia flight that crashed into the Java Sea more than two weeks ago. The flight data recorder was pulled from beneath the aircraft's wing today. Search crews have also detected the plane's cockpit voice recorder underwater. They hope to use data from both of these recorders to determine why the plane crashed with 160 people on board. Only 48 victims have been recovered so far. A senior White House official says Cuba has now completed the release of 53 political prisoners. This clears a major hurdle for the normalization of ties between Cuba and the U.S. Now, most of the released dissidents belong to the Patriotic Union of Cuba. That is an anti-government group. Their release was part of the historic U.S. agreement last month with the Cuban government. Days before the Pope's visit, Sri Lanka elects a new president. My three Palala Siri Sena is a big surprise, with most people expecting the incumbent to win a third term until just a week ago. Siri Sena appoints his new cabinet today, announcing he will call elections for parliament in three months. Sri Lanka went through a quarter century of civil war that ended in 2009. Now the Sinhalese ethnic group makes up three quarters of the population. The Tamil and other minorities comprise the rest. About 7% of Sri Lanka's 21 million people are Catholic. There are similar numbers of Hindus and Muslims, but the majority religion there is Buddhist. Timothy Shaw is associate director of the Religious Freedom Project at Georgetown's Berkeley Center. How do you see this newly elected president and his role in the papal visit? Well, in a way, uh, the election creates a positive climate uh, for the Pope's visit. We were expecting that the Pope would be landing. Of course, he's traveling right now uh, in, in very stormy political weather because we expected that President Rajapaksa, as the uh, previous piece emphasized, uh, would be reelected. Rajapaksa's agenda was very militant and nationalist, uh, very different from what the Pope is expected to emphasize, which is peace and reconciliation. 
uh, President Sirisena, the surprise victor, uh, has an agenda very similar, I think, to the agenda of Pope Francis for this visit, visit one of reconciliation, uh, one of bringing the country together, both ethnically and religiously. So I think the Pope will not be landing in stormy waters, but waters very positive and, uh, and receptive for Pope Francis. Do you think the newly elected president will be very visible? Uh, yes, I think he will uh, during the Pope's visit. Uh, one of the first uh, items on uh, Pope Francis' agenda is to visit President Sirisena, newly elected President Sirisena, uh, tomorrow, uh, shortly after he arrives. So I think he will be very visible. Uh, and also the election gives Pope Francis an opportunity to congratulate uh, this country uh, on a, a, an election that uh, turned out to be much more positive, much more democratic and fair in which the opposition surprisingly uh, won. So that also creates a very positive uh, uh, climate for President Sirisena. There's still a lot of ethnic division. Does the Catholic Church, and I know it's a minority mm -hmm. in Sri, La Sri Lanka, but does it bridge any of that ethnicity? Yes, it does. Uh, the Catholic Church and the Christian community more broadly uh, are really unique because they, they are the only religious community in the country that have uh, significant numbers of Tamils and uh, Sinhalese. Uh, most other religious communities are very homogeneous, uh, either uh, uh, all one ethnicity or, or another. The Buddhists are almost all Sinhalese, uh, and the Tamils are almost all uh, uh, Hindu. The Hindus are almost all Tamils, I should say. Uh, but the Christian community bridges uh, these two groups in a, in a unique way. And it's significant, therefore, that Pope Francis will be visiting the uh, shrine uh, that was mentioned in the preceding piece uh, in northern uh, Sri Lanka, which is a site that both Sinhalese and Tamils actually visit. So it's very sy symbolic of the kind of reconciliation that both President Sirisena and Pope Francis will want to promote uh, during this next week. And very quickly, because it's such a small number of Catholics uh, per capita yes. in Sri Lanka versus the Philippines. Yes. Will those be very different visits? Yes, they will be very different visits. The, the themes of Pope Francis's visit uh, in Sri Lanka will be, one, the importance of the church as an agent of peace and reconciliation in a war-torn country, uh, but also the importance of full religious freedom for all the country's religious minorities in Sri Lanka. Both Christians and Muslims have been the victims of increasing attacks uh, by extremist Buddhists. Uh, in Sri Lanka, and the Pope will want to uh, uh, resist that and challenge that in the name of religious freedom. In the Philippines, by contrast, the themes are expected to be the family uh, as well as the environment. Uh, so we'll see a very different uh, political agenda and spiritual agenda in the Philippines. Great insight. Tim Shaw, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you, Brian. Coming up, the Supreme Court hears a case of an Arizona church claiming its free speech rights are being violated. And 33 babies are baptized by Pope Francis in the Sistine Chapel on Sunday's Feast of the Baptism of the Lord. On Monday evening, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. Church signs are at the center of a Supreme Court debate today. A small Arizona Christian community claims the town of Gilbert is favoring politicians while violating that group's free speech rights. Jason Calvey was inside the high court today and he has the story tonight. During campaign seasons, political signs fill the landscape in the Phoenix suburb of Gilbert. These signs can be up for five months and can be 32 square feet. Temporary signs with an ideological message like those that urge peace can be 20 square feet and don't have to come down. But signs directing people to an event like a rally or a church service can only be six feet and can only go up 12 hours before the event. The town says it's limiting distractions for drivers and stopping clutter. If you allow large signs uh, along a, an unlimited route for an unlimited period of time, uh, you can imagine what that would do uh, to the scenery and to the byways and highways of, of our, of, you know, of our, of our uh, neighborhoods. But 82-year-old Reverend Clyde Reed of the Protestant Good News Community Church says his free speech is violated. His signs leading people to services can only go up 12 hours before when it's dark. The whole experience has been shocking to me. Our signs inviting people to church are very important, yet are treated as second-class speech. So the pastor's attorney says all signs should be treated equally. We don't think the government uh, should be able to value some speech higher than others, which is what it did in this case. Uh, it has decided that political speech is much more important than the church's uh, invitation to their services, and we think that's certainly a problem. But the town says its sign ordinance is fine because it doesn't single out any religion and applies to all signs for any events. 
Inside court today, there were lots of tough questions for both sides. At one point, though, Justice Breyer said, well, my goodness, it does sound as if the town is being a little unreasonable, doesn't it? We expect a decision in this case by the end of the term in June. Here at the Supreme Court, Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. All right, Jason, Kerry Severino is chief counsel and policy director of the Judicial Crisis Network. Now, this case in Arizona is focused on free speech. Why do you think it's important to religious groups? Well, the real question here is whether this, the town's regulations are content neutral. Under the First Amendment, uh, the government can, can regulate things like, you know, say signs can only be a certain size, but they can't base it on your content, so they're favoring certain types of speech over others. In a, in a situation, in a world where the government and the society at large is increasingly hostile to religion and to religious groups, I think we have to be particularly concerned that if the government starts picking and choosing which kinds of speech they want, it wouldn't be surprising that in cases like this one, we're going to see governments who are going to be uh, biasing their laws against religion. Very interesting case. Switching now to the so-called same-sex marriage debate, another ruling, a federal judge declares South Dakota's ban on same-sex marriage unconstitutional. How likely is it the Supreme Court is going to take up this redefinition of marriage issue, and when do you think we'll know? Well, it's incredibly likely, and actually we, we just missed one potential chance they could have taken it up. They considered it up Friday, and it sounds like they, they haven't decided yet whether they're taking the cases from a major Sixth Circuit decision, but I, I predict that it's almost certain that they will take it. If not that case, then per perhaps the Fifth Circuit that's, that's uh, considering arguments now. It's almost certain. The only question is when. Will it be this term or will it be next term? So when it does, what are some of the linchpin issues that it will address, the legal issues? Well, the, the key question is, does the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, passed in the wake of the Civil War, did that, was that intended to encompass things like same-sex marriage and, and, and redefining marriage as we know it? I think as an original matter of what did this originally mean, that's pretty clear. But unfortunately, that's not what the court's always looking to, uh, the original meaning of the, of the constitutional text. So it will, it will, it will uh, bring in some other issues of whether that constitutional provision has developed, perhaps, over the last 150 years. Chief Counsel and Policy Director for the Judicial Crisis Network, Carrie Severino, great to have you back. Thanks. Thank you. Haitians are gathering today, marking five years since a devastating earthquake left much of their capital in ruins. That magnitude seven quake rattled Port-au-Prince and the surrounding area. It was one of the worst natural disasters of modern times. Hundreds of Catholics prayed at mass early this morning, remembering this tragic anniversary. More than 200,000 people died and more than a million were left homeless by that quake. Pope Francis encouraged Christians to remember their baptism with joy in his Sunday Angelus address. The Holy Father reminded the faithful to pray to the Holy Spirit often because, quote, he helps us move forward. Francis warned against Christian communities who are deaf to the Holy Spirit and become mute and unable to evangelize. On Sunday's Feast of the Baptism of the Lord, the Pope baptized 33 babies in the Sistine Chapel. They are children of Vatican employees. Francis says the Word of God is like a mother's nourishing milk. He encouraged the families to get into the habit of reading the gospel to their little ones. Pope Francis says children become true Christians when they are immersed in the warmth of God's love. Up next, Scottish Archbishop Leo Cushley joins us to explore the Pope's trip and the church in Scotland. And actor Michael Keaton mentions his mom, the mass, and even the rosary at the Golden Globe Awards. As we continue our embracing compassion coverage of this week's papal trip, to Sri Lanka and the Philippines. Let's look at a tweet from Pope Francis today. He says, please pray with me for everyone in Sri Lanka and the Philippines as I begin my trip. Thank you so much for joining us on this Monday evening, January 12th. I'm Brian Patrick and millions of Sri Lankans and Filipinos are preparing to greet Pope Francis on his second Asian pilgrimage. Meanwhile, Catholic leaders across the globe are talking about the impact of this trip and the Holy Father's ministry. Archbishop Leo Cushley worked directly with Pope Francis as head of the English language section at the Vatican Secretariat of State. Then in 2013, the Holy Father appointed him to the Archdiocese of St. Andrews in Edinburgh, Scotland. And we are blessed to have the Archbishop with us here in Washington. Thank you, Thank you for coming, Your Excellency. Pleasure. So, you know Pope Francis better than many. I wonder what your mm -hmm. thoughts are on his ministry and the purpose of this trip. Um, I think that probably changed quite a bit with the uh, 
the election of a new president there in Sri, Sri Lanka. Lanka. Um, certainly, that, that would have given them a little bit of extra work very late in the day um, when they would have expected to have had everything already under control. Um, so I don't know that that would have uh, changed significantly what the Holy Father would have intended to say to, for example, the Catholics there, who are our main constituency. Um, so I don't know that there would be a dramatic change at the last minute, but one or two things would have to be tweaked. Names would have to be changed, you can imagine the kind of thing. And don't you think this Holy Father talks to a more broad audience than Catholics on he, these trips? He does undoubtedly. Wherever he goes, any, any Pope would be the same. Mm -hmm. um, when I accompanied uh, Pope Benedict on his trips as well, it was like that. We, we had to and we wanted to talk to a broader audience. Um, so it depended in, on your interlocutor. You would pitch some things at some people, some things at others. Mm -hmm. I wonder how the so-called Francis factor that we hear a lot about in the yes. media, how that's playing out in Scotland. Well, um, I worked with both Pope Benedict and Pope Francis, and Pope Benedict was there on the very first state visit of a pontiff to the United Kingdom. Right. And he started his visit in Edinburgh. And I have to say, it, you know, with all you know, modesty and so on. It was a huge success. It was. Um, and uh, I only had a very small part to play in that, but I saw many people doing wonderful things to make it a great success, including Pope Benedict himself. And so he is still um, admired and there's still a great affection for him. Having said that, um, Pope Francis as well, even though he's not been there yet, and who knows if one day he could make it there, um, there is already a great respect for him and affection for him, and not just among Catholics. Even the moderator of the Church of Scotland is going to be meeting him in mid-February. Wonderful. And he's going over to the Vatican, and I'm delighted that that's going to take place. We only have a short time left, but the independence vote or referendum, yes. Scots voted down. Yes. Uh, what, what has it been like in Scotland since then? Since then, it's, it's gone fairly quiet. Um, we had a, a, a very robust and frank but very democratic debate and a very mature debate. Um, not a shot was fired. Um, a few <laughs> eggs were fired and that was it, really. Uh, and, uh, and apart from that, there was a, a due process and there was an outcome. And we can be proud of ourselves that we debated our country's future and we did it in a very democratic way. And we enjoyed watching it. Your Excellency Bishop Cushley, thanks for being with us, Archbishop. Thank you. Well, finally, the first college football playoff climaxes tonight with the national championship game. Ohio State plays Oregon, AT&T Stadium, Arlington, Texas tonight. The semifinal games, the Sugar and Rose Bowls, were the two most watched programs in cable TV history. So this is the first year the NCAA has implemented a four-team playoff format determining a football champion. The Oregon Ducks are a touchdown favorite to beat the Buckeyes of the Ohio State. Yeah, that's how they say it in Columbus. Celebrities and movie makers converged on Beverly Hills for last night's 72nd Golden Globe Awards. The independent film Boyhood dominated. The film, 12 years in the making, won Best Director, Best Supporting Actress, and Best Drama. The Grand Budapest Hotel won Best Picture in the Comedy or Musical category. Michael Keaton wins Best Actor in that category for his role in Birdman. Get this, he thanked his parents for his upbringing in a large Catholic household. I don't ever remember a time when my father didn't work two jobs, when my mother wasn't saying the rosary or going to mass or trying to take care of seven kids in a run-down farmhouse. This is Keaton's first Golden Globe Award, and I'm sure that his parents have been praying for a long time. Well, thank you so much. Be sure to join us each night this week. Our EWTN News Nightly team follows the travels of Pope Francis. We'll have our Embracing Compassion coverage. Our special coverage will continue tomorrow and through the week into next week as well. Until then, for all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Good night and may God bless you.